Hey guys, welcome to Ultimate Survival Tips. I'm David. It's good to be back with you as we get into episode number 10 of our Survival Quick Tips training series. Last time in episode number nine, we discussed shelter building. And today, I'm excited to share with you the 10 keys to make a foolproof fire in any situation. But before we get into our topic today, make sure you smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, and click the bell icon to get notified when we post every video in this important training series. And to see our new line of four new MSK1 knives for this year, go check out ultimatesurvivaltips.com. Okay, let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome to this edition of Survival Quick Tips, which is part of the Tiny Survival Guide Learning System and our full Tiny Survival Masterclass online training. In this segment, Dave and I will take a few minutes to break down a very vital emergency preparedness or survival topic that's found in the Tiny Survival Guide. Guess what? It's Amazon's number one pick for EDC Survival Guides. Fantastic. I love it. And along the way, we'll be sharing a few action steps that you can put into practice today. Okay, everyone. So we are going to be referencing section I, which is fire in the tiny survival guide, as we take you through seven keys to making a guaranteed survival fire in any situation. Let's get into this. All right, everybody, as we get into this, let's get on the same page. And Craig, could you quickly relate our topic of fire to the rule of three and some psychological and physical reasons why fire is critically important? Yeah, fire goes directly hand in hand, as we discussed in the section of quick tips on sheltering, because it's all about thermal regulation. So if you lose core body temp, which typically the worst situation is where it's cold and you're losing body temp, it's harder to get that body temp there than it is for you to cool down with your hot. In the rule of threes, you've got to figure out how to get core body temp either maintained or restored within three hours, or you'll fall victim to the to hypothermia. Okay, now let's get into the seven keys to making a boss survival fire. First of all, the fire law of threes, as I call it, which is three fire sources. Let's discuss that first. Yeah, I'm a big fan of having a backup for the backup when it comes to fire building. The way I do it, and David, I'd love to hear how you do it because you may do it differently than I do. As far as starting a fire, I have a lighter in my pocket, I have a backup lighter in my pack, and then I have a ferro cerium rod that's a backup for that. I go with a ferro rod first. I always have some sort of a, a quick light tinder in my wallet and then a lighter as my backup to my ferro rod, which if I had my lighter and it was functional, I'd obviously use that first. Okay, fire triangle. Let's talk through that. That's really important. And this is a key, everybody, to being able to diagnose any fire and figuring out what the problem is if you have a problem, which we all have had problems with fire, right, Craig? Uh, so the big thing for me that I see after training hundreds and hundreds of people is ego. It's mm -hmm. real easy to get into the way of building fires. It's real easy for it to just sink its teeth into fire building. Therefore, I'd like to take it just back to the science. You need three things to make a fire. You need an ignition source, you need a fuel source, and you need oxygen. If you're attempting to build a fire and it's not working, then just think about the science of it. Which one of those things is not working properly? Is there not enough oxygen? Is your ignition source not hot enough to make something combust? Is the fuel source too wet or too damp, or is it just not suitable to building a fire? So take everything back to eighth grade science, which is the fire triangle, fuel source, ignition source, and oxygen. Next one, make sure your fuel is dry. The big thing that happens often is people don't use uh, dry wood. They either, either use wood that is damp or wet, or they use green wood. So here's a couple things to keep in mind when getting and gathering firewood. Number one is I pick up a stick that I might utilize to get a fire started, then I'm going to break it. And if it breaks cleanly and makes an audible snap and it breaks completely in two, then I'll use it. If I break that limb and it doesn't make that audible snap and it gets stuck together and it's hard to pull apart, it's probably got enough moisture in it that it's wanting to hold together. Therefore, that's my first test. Breaks cleanly apart 
and it makes an audible snap. Number two to remember is I never pick up, I, I might do this later after the fire's going, but to get a fire started, I never want to pick anything off the ground. So no matter what you find on the ground, there's going to be some moisture that's in it or on it, particularly on the bottom side, because anything in contact with the ground is going to have some moisture. And so those are a few things that I do to get that first set of materials that I need to get a fire started. I want to make sure it's optimal. So that's what I do. I've seen you use in training your hand and your wrist as a uh, just a general rule as far as what tinder and what fuel is. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, I usually just look at it from my hand perspective just as a thing to jog people's memory. First thing I'm going to get as far as tinder is stuff about the thickness of your fingernail. That's the papery type thickness of stuff. That's cedar bark. That's dry grass or something of that nature. And then I want to get a ball of that about the size of my head or about the size of a soft. And then I get stuff smaller than my pinky finger that's the tiny smaller than a pencil size stuff gather a ball of it a bundle of it about the size of my head on up to stuff about the size of my thumb then a bundle of stuff about the size of my wrist and that way you have all that gathered sitting right in front of you before you ever start to try to light that fire gather tinder that is dry that's a key yeah if you're up north i'm a big fan of birch uh, we do not have that where I'm from. So I would be all about the aspens and the birches if I was up north. That is a fantastic resource down here in my neck of the woods, literally my neck of the woods. Cedar is a good choice. You can use pine sap and stuff of that nature, but the key is finding tinder that's dry. So find dry, dead trees or something of that nature, pull them apart. If they don't come apart, like for example, they're not pine needles. Like if you can find a dead branch of pine needles on it or cedar needles or some of that nature, it's going to be a fantastic resource, but you can scrape your birch. You can scrape even cedar. You can scrape poplar, for example, just to get that fine material that you need really dry. Okay. Gather kindling, discuss what kindling is versus tinder and other fuel like logs. Kindling is that stuff that's just slightly above the size of tinder. That's that stuff around the size of your pinky finger, if not smaller. I will prepare it by getting all the bark off of it, even if it is dry. And that way I can get to even drier wood underneath the bark and then scrape it up so it has a lot of edge to it. Or you can slice those off and make sure they're still connected. That's what most people call feather sticks. That way you've got the stuff that you need to start building from size of the smallest, thinnest stuff up to the bigger where you're going. So that's why when you're building a fire, you might want to add some oxygen by blowing on it, which does add some moisture. So if you figure out how to make something from your environment, or if you have something available to you to create a fan, that'll allow to put more dry air into the fire rather than you blowing on it. Bonus tip number two, logs, Craig. So you get a sustainable fire and you want to, you're getting, you're into the evening. Do you need a saw? Would you put the effort into sawing no. large pieces of wood down to no. smaller pieces to fit? I'll go ahead and stop you right now. No, not at all. Uh, I don't think we need to be cutting logs into the tiny little sections that we see in a fireplace at home. Maybe, you know, I do that for home and I do that for camping, but for survival, that's not needed at all. If you have a fire and then you have a 10 foot piece of limb, that's maybe six, eight inches, then you can lay that directly on the fire and guess what's going to cut it in half the fire. And that way you don't have to put the effort into cutting stuff up into small logs such that it fits in a fireplace because you're building a fire for the sake of staying alive. You're not building a fire for the sake of, you know, roasting chestnuts over an open fire and singing songs and eating popcorn, stuff like that. Next up, make sure your fire is safe. Yeah, I'm a big fan of looking up, looking down, looking left and looking right when building a fire. I want to make sure that what's directly above the fire is not going to catch flame. So that includes your tarp setup. That also includes a tree that might be over you. It's going to dry those leaves out anyway. So that would be something. And I'm a big fan of taking about a 10 foot radius around where I'm building the fire. If there's leaves on the ground and removing them and taking that all the way to soil. Keep your fire high and dry. I like to build a fire raft. What I mean by that is I like to clear the area and then I'll put some sticks down on the ground and build my fire on top of that. What that does is a couple of things. Number one, it allows some channels for oxygen to get through that's in between the fire raft sticks or logs or what have you there, as well as it pulls it up off the ground because the ground is an incredible 
conductor of heat. If you put your fire down on it, it's going to pull fire away from, or it's going to pull heat away from the fire. Can we go ahead and use rocks then? What about river rocks? Rocks are okay as long as they're dry. You never want to pull rocks out of a river. They'll basically explode like a bomb. And rocks that are exceptionally cold are problematic. If a rock is very cold because the temperatures are very cold, then they also will pull heat away from the flame. Okay, everyone, we are again out of time for this survival quick tips segment but in a moment craig and i are going to continue our conversation with some exclusive content for our tiny survival master class students that will include how to make a fire from scratch when everything is wet so guys and guys if you want access it's really important content i've got a lot of experience building fires in the rain and having our students build fires in the rain so I know what works and what doesn't work, so come back for that. This type of stuff is going to help you get on the fast track to identifying and plugging into your survival, safety, security, and overall emergency preparedness gaps and fixing those gaps. What you need to do is use the link in the description below or go over to tinysurvivalmasterclass.com. So that's been it for fire building. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're watching or listening for more survival quick tips. And please, HBO, share this content with others. We love sharing it with you, and we would love to see you share it with someone else because that's really appreciative that you can do that for other people. We appreciate you, and they'll appreciate you for it. It's free to do so. Come on. It's so free. Now, with that said, until next time, keep it simple, be positive, and stay sharp. For your convenience, I've placed links to everything mentioned in the video description. Make sure you smash that like button and click the bell icon to get notified when we post new survival and preparedness content. To support this channel and encourage us to continue to create new videos and sweet, innovative new gear, go check out our new line of MSK1 knives and EDC gear over at ultimatesurvivaltips.com. And last but not least, don't forget to go check out our five-star rated podcast, The Survival Show on all major podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Okay, this is David. I hope to see you on the other side. And remember, be prepared because you never know.